So, uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon to the participants, resource persons. Uh, let us begin our last of this program. Uh, before we uh, start, let me give a brief introduction of our resource person. Today's resource person is Pritha Chakravarti. Uh, Pritha Chakravarti is a visiting assistant professor of writing at the Center for Writing and Pedagogy, Kriya University. Uh, and prior to this, uh, she has taught writing, research methods, media theory, journalism, and film studies at various institutes of Symbiosis International and has conducted, conducted several workshops on academic writing, often in collaboration with her CWP colleagues. Nitha is also a resource person for Oxford University Press to conduct webinars on creative pedagogy and has a PhD in cultural studies from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. And her topic today is what it looks like, what it means writing up field notes. So over to you, Pritha. Thank you so much, Amalima. So I think we have at least 30-40% of the people have turned up, a little more than that. So I think I'll begin. Uh, so, so far in this workshop, we have looked at different aspects of academic writing. We started off with an earlier session on questions, the different kind of questions we ask. Uh, following that, Samit took us through uh, the act of close reading, attentive reading. He pointed out uh, how there are explicit and implicit meanings and hidden in the text, uh, paying attention to which often leads us to our arguments or analysis. Uh, following that, Shantan took us to the world of science writing and uh, introduced us to the differences between how uh, things work in the world of science versus the world of uh, social sciences humanities. Uh, Samit, uh, in the last session, of course, uh, took us on this very, very exciting ride on complications and uh, showing us the difference between uh, what is what it means to write simplistically and to make complex arguments uh, so on that like you know uh, note and on that uh, in the light of all of that has been covered uh, one of the things that most of you suggested and most of you kept asking for is a session which would be more focused on social sciences uh, so today's session hopefully will meet out that demand and I will quickly share my screen Is my screen visible to all of you? If you could quickly put a yes or no on the chat box. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So the topic of today's session is what it looks like, what it means. Very simple. Uh, sometimes what it looks like, it's not so. Sometimes what it looks like, the meaning is something deeper, it's hidden and we need to tease it out. Uh, more importantly, the subtitle is what I would like to draw your attention to, which is writing up field notes. Uh, now, as researchers in social sciences, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are have had your share of experiences on the field, and uh, you have gone ahead and uh, done your field work where you have uh, gone and taken notes and taken uh, your uh, interview transcripts and interview recordings and so on and so forth. So today, what we'll do in today's session is actually very simple. What we'll do is uh, we will look at field notes across disciplines. And it's often uh, like, you know, th there's a misconception that uh, field notes is something which is only the realm of social sciences. I'll show it to you that that is not so much true. And uh, following that, uh, the workshop will be divided into three sections. Uh, first, we will be looking at uh, writing up events. 
So what we observe, uh, observe in the field, the events that we observe, how do we write it up? How do we present it in our, bring it into our writing? Uh, second is writing up interviews. So say you have gone, conducted an interview, recorded it, you have your transcript now. Uh, how do you bring it into your work? Because we discussed earlier that interview is a genre in itself and academic writing is a different genre. So how does uh, these two things come together? So that's the second thing that we'll be looking at. And last but not the least, we'll also take a look at uh, writing up data, uh, because while uh, it is often thought of that, you know, uh, data is the realm of quantitative research, and it's a different, totally different kind of research uh, from what qualitative methods are. Uh, the thing is, they actually can go hand in hand, and that's something that I intend to show you uh, in the course of this workshop. Uh, I would like to hear from you at the very outset. Uh, what do you think of this image here on the uh, first slide itself? Uh, there is a like you know picture, a hand drawing you can see uh, with certain kind of labeling. Uh, what do you think this is? Any responses in the chat box would be wonderful. I'm monitoring the chat. Yes, thank you so much, Anton. What do you think this image is of? It doesn't have to be accurate. A dinosaur, Anusha says. OK, uh, maybe a relative of a dinosaur. <laughs> a monitor lizard. Uh, OK, OK, we are, we are in the same family. We are moving around the same family. Yes, it is some kind of lizard, Deepti. It's actually uh, called a lizard basilisk. Those of you who are Potterheads here, if there are any Harry Potter fans, uh, you would have come across the name. The name basilisk would have a different meaning to you for you, right? Uh, you would think of a snake, but this is a, a lizard which is called the lizard basilisk. And here, what you see is actually a field note. This is actually an, uh, like a page from a field note uh, of a zoologist who has spotted this, drawn this out, marked out the parts, and uh, you know done a certain kind of illustration of the same. OK, so that means what? That means that field notes is not something exclusive to the social scientists, right? So let's take a look at, the, at these things now. Take a minute. Take a look at these images. What do you think is common among all these images? Once again, please put your responses in the chat. Yes, that would be wonderful if you could write it out. Shaman uh, saying graphic, graphic notes. notes, fantastic. Uh, Dr. Abdul says labeling. Yes, different kinds of labeling. What else? Anusha has said illustrations. Illustrations, OK. Can you guess what subjects or disciplines uh, can these be from? Are they all from the same discipline? What does it seem like? Himani says these do not look strictly linear. OK, OK, Himani. Geography, maybe, uh, Ashima says. Dr. Abdul says, no, they are not from the same discipline. Very, very right. In fact, the first one on top, on the top left-hand corner, uh, is from the discipline of geology. And uh, this is, again, from a field note book. It's a diary, field note diary. It's a page out of that. The one below that, uh, the one you see, it is actually from anthropology. Uh, the one right in the middle, of course, uh, as Dr. Abdul also points out, it's from uh, literature. And even though it's not field notes, it's notes nevertheless, right? And uh, on, then on the right hand side, we have notes from zoology. And we also have a tiny image of a river there, which is from geography. So what we see here are notes. And what are notes? Notes are basically pieces of writing. So when we say academic writing, 
we are doing this workshop on academic writing, we are, of course, thinking about the finished product. We are thinking about, you know, our academic essay or book chapter or even a monograph, whatever we are looking for. But uh, when we look at these images, we realize the amount of writing that goes behind that process. So in a lot of ways, this is like the BTS, the behind the screen writing that happens uh, before we embark on the journey of academic writing. And all of these kind of notes, are, I'm sure like all of you who have done any amount of research would agree with me that uh, these kind of writings are quite common. We, have, we, we all have uh, either virtual or uh, like in the notebook, depending on our familiarity or, or like, you know, whatever we are comfortable with. Uh, but we do have we do write a lot of stuff before we finally sit down to write on that blank word document. So. Here, when we think about field notes, these are notes, different kinds of notes. Among these, when we think about field notes in particular, uh, all the images I have shown to you are all hand-drawn notes or like, you know, they, they, they are like on the, uh, drawn on the notebook, written on the notebook. Uh, but today, of course, we are in a technologically much advanced world. And when you go to your field, you're more likely to carry your camera, recorder, dictaphone, the, your phone camera, for instance. Uh, and the mode in which we capture what we see has changed. The, uh, the, uh, the medium through which we capture what we see has changed. So earlier, if we were drawing and writing uh, stuff, today we also we might, we might be doing that, but we are more likely to take photographs. And on the right hand side, what you see is uh, uh, like a page from a, a final product, a final essay, scientific essay uh, in that vein, uh, which was circulated earlier uh, to you. So this particular uh, essay, it has this images, which is like the image, the photograph of a butterfly. And it has these, you know, micrographs, which are uh, detailed images of the parts of the butterfly, the cross section and so on and so forth. So uh, there is a change in technology. And with that, the way we take notes, the way we collect notes, they have that has also changed. Uh, but when we think about field notes, we always think about the outside. Am I right? We always think that we go out somewhere and, uh, you know, get these notes, collect these notes. So take a look at this image on your left. This is also present in the handout that has been given to you in case it is not clear here. Uh, what do you think about this? Can we call this a field note? Yes, no. Any observations, if you could put down on the chat box, that would be wonderful. Yes, it could because be Nikita. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And it can be because if you think about it, this is actually a page out of uh, Linus Pauling, who's a chemist, uh, his uh, field, his lab notes. Yes, Dr. Abdul, thank you for that. It's the lab. It's a page out of the lab notes of Linus Pauling. And uh, if you think about it, a chemist's field is the laboratory, right? Uh, a chemist is someone who's working in the laboratory. That's his field. That's where he's observing things and he's coming up with stuff. So, uh, yes, uh, this, is, this is something we can probably think of as a field note. And let's pay a little, a little bit of attention uh, to this. Uh, but before we do that, I want to hear from all of you uh, one word to describe this page. How would you describe this page? Just by looking at it, how would you describe this page? Chaotic. Thank you so much, Anusha. Wonderful, wonderful. Anything else? Any other observations? What are the words? Noisy, messy, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I'll actually, uh, you know, note these things down. Just a minute. Olovi says mind mapping, which is different from chaotic. So I think you should put that. Rough work. Rough work. Sharma says rough work. Niketa says messy. Polumi says mind mapping. 
rough work. Okay. Anything else? You also want to put in noisy. Noisy. Dipti says noisy. Yes. The journal entry. Says, it is. It is a journal entry. It is a journal entry. It is a journal entry. <clears throat> okay. So let's see if we can make something out of this mess. It is messy, it is chaotic, it is noisy. And thank you, Pulami, for pointing out it is mind mapping, and we will come to why it is mind mapping also shortly. So, what you see on the top, you see the title of this particular page, which is water. That is the topic on which uh, Pauling is doing his research, right? In, in this uh, while he is on this page. And uh, you see that the date is given. Uh, and I have written out the transcription as well here for your reference. Uh, just to read out to you the initial part in case it's not clear. It begins by saying, Dr. Oleg Jardetsky is interested in the hydration of ions. This has suggested to me that we search for a simple structure. And then he goes on to the details of the uh, scientific details, which I'm not uh, very clear about myself. So I'm not going to try to unravel that. But just by looking at this, just by looking at uh, this one and a half sentence, now uh, what do you think is uh, happening here? What, like this is uh, Linus Pauling's notebook. What, who is Oleg Jarditsky? Why is he coming in his notes? What do you think? Possibly a collaborator. Possibly a collaborator, yes. What does this show? If this is a collaborator, what does this show? That what 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 are one of the things that we do put in our journal entry or uh, field notes or uh, you know whatever mind mapping rough work that we are doing all the writing uh, before our final writing. Written self talk on potential connections with other work. Excellent. So it's about, uh, we talked about acknowledgement in Shantan's session, uh, reflecting on like, you know, who are the other scholars? What are they doing? Talking about the same topic. Probably, you know, inspiration that this is what led uh, Pauling to take up this research. We don't know. But yes, absolutely, Ananya, the, inspir the being inspired by the work of others to extend the talk. So we know that academic work is work that we build on the work of other academics, work of others. Uh, so that is something that comes into the notes. The second thing I would want you to pay attention to uh, is if you look at the uh, second part, it says one possibility involves and then he goes on to say what that possibility is. What does the word possibility signify? What do you think, uh, like, would, would you uh, really uh, be, is possibility something that is sure? When would you write something like this? A hypothesis? Yes, it is a hypothesis. It could be a hypothesis. For speculation. Thank you so much, Deepthi. Exactly. You know, you're thinking, you're thinking through. And that's where I think uh, what uh, um, Polumi was saying about mind mapping becomes very important, that you're thinking through that, okay, is this possible? It's speculation, it's conjecture. Now, uh, moving on to the next part, if you see, uh, there is a calculation given and then he writes density equal to 0 0.98. And beside that, he writes not bad. He also double underlines the 0 0.98. What is that not bad? What is the function of that not bad? Is it something that will come as it is in the work? Yes, note to self. Uh, his comments, Yuvrat says he's close to the solution. Yes, it's possibly an indication that this is a solution that will come in his paper because, you know, it, it works. 
it's probably an indication of that of course again it's a conjecture on our part uh, but it is a comment that he is making it is a observation that he is making his note to self that he is making again going back to the mind mapping that is that we see happening uh, in this piece of writing now if you come to the very bottom of the text you will see the these calculations and a lot of things happening there uh, can you think of one word to say what is exactly happening there? I see a lot of scribbles. Like lot of scribbles, yes. Practice. Absolutely, lot of scribbles. Correction, thank you so much, Namita. Lots of revising, lot of corrections. What are corrections? They're revisions, right? Now think about that you are a, a scholar in social sciences, you're a scholar in humanities. We also have our share of revisions and corrections and uh, redrafting over and over again, rewriting. Thank you, Polomi, which happens over and over again before we get to that final stage of writing. But as far as a field note is concerned, as far as this rough work is concerned, it is chaotic, it is noisy, it is messy, and there is no doubt about that. But then the question is, what do we do with this mess? And how does this mess get translated in our final work? So to do this, and this is where I come to uh, what would be the majority of our session today, the text we'll be dealing with. Uh, we'll be looking at a thesis, a PhD thesis of uh, Asher Gertner. And we uh, did, Ananya did talk about him uh, in an earlier session, although we have not dealt with his work so far uh, in any of the sessions. So uh, he's someone who has done this uh, work, this, the this thesis that he submitted at the University of California. And uh, later it has come up as a book in 2015, a revised version of that. Uh, although what we will be looking at is the thesis because. Uh, a thesis is uh, one of those fundamental pieces of writing, the first pieces of writing, full length monograph writing that we do. Uh, so I thought we'll take a look at it. And it also uh, is something that holds together all the mess that we encounter in our fieldwork, right? So this thesis, which is titled Ruled, Rule by Aesthetics, World Class City Making in Delhi. This is a thesis very heavily dependent on fieldwork. It's uh, actually a work uh, which Gertner is doing in the Department of Energy and Resources, uh, which is a branch of geography and uh, economics. It's like an interdisciplinary uh, department. And uh, although if you take a look at it, it is a very solid work of urban studies, for instance. And uh, this particular, the argument that uh, Gertner is making in this thesis is that, uh, okay, let me take a look at the slums in Delhi. Let me take a look at uh, the slums which are getting demolished, the slums which are in the process of getting demolished, which have been demolished. Uh, and at the same time, he's also juxtaposing that field work with field work he's conducting in these gated societies with, you know, resident welfare associations. By mapping these two field works together, along with a lot of other things, what he's arguing is that there is a certain aesthetic hegemony at play, that there is a certain kind of dominant aesthetics that is coming up uh, in the narrative of the people, in the discourses of the people, uh, about a certain kind of world class city. And uh, he's, of course, doing this research between 2005, 2010, around that time. Uh, so this was uh, also the time when Delhi was, those of you who are from Delhi would know it is undergoing a lot of changes, the metro rails coming up and all of those things happening. And this is the time that Gertner is located in Delhi and he uh, does this research. Uh, some of you asked about uh, doing research in uh, like how do you translate research done in the field in other languages, in other Indian languages, for instance, to English. That is also something that would come up here because Gertner is working with a lot of material, a lot of responses which are coming in Hindi. 
and uh, other such languages. Uh, so let's take a look at it without further ado. And this particular section, the excerpt one in your uh, handout, those of you who have the handout, if you could open it up and take a look just to make it easy to read. Uh, but before that, I would also want one volunteer uh, who would read this out for me, this paragraph. This is a paragraph from Chapter 5 of uh, Gertner's text. And the Chapter 5 is entirely on field work that he has done in the slum called the Shiv Camp. So uh, I would request a volunteer, someone to please read this out for us. May I have some volunteers? I don't. Yes, Satish, thank you so much. Can you Can unmute? You? Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are. January in Delhi brings cold. Maybe fog gets killed once born, leading people to hover over stoves in anticipation of coming spring. On the evening of January, January 3rd, the dawn of 2007, on a night when temperatures would dip as low as degree, 3 degrees Celsius, a team of 50 policemen. Four bulldozers and a dozen municipal corporation officers descended upon Shiv camp. Women were taking water from the community tap, children were playing in the street, fighting the cold, and their laboring men had not yet returned from their construction site. A child yelled, The car away, government has come, and a group of officers stepped forward, asking for the Pradhan. While the demolition squad went, for child ship. Uh, camp residents were told that in 30 minutes the bulldozers and slave hammers would begin their work. A high court order had been issued to clear a 35 foot wide path through the middle of the bus. People panicked. Which hearts would fall? Which would remain? What was going to happen to those displays? Why was this happening? The chief officer recommended that people remove. The belongings from their home before turning to rich tribe. This cup of tar people scattered. Some shouted, others followed the officers, begging for answers. Thank you uh, so much, Satish. Yeah, uh, so there's a footnote also uh, added to the word Pradhan in the text. Could you also read that out for us? A Pradhan is a headman or term used primarily to designate an informal or elected leader in the village and rarely used in urban context except in Bhaskis. Pradhan literally means prime or first. Prime Minister in India, Prime Minister in Hindi is Pradhan Mantri. Thank you so much, Satish. Okay, so let me ask you, let me begin by asking you, that what are some of the things that you notice in this paragraph that could have possibly been a part of Gertner's field notes? So one of the things and very primary thing I have noted it down, which is the location that is in Delhi. Uh, it's date, the January 3rd. Could I interrupt you for a moment? Yes, Ananya. Yeah. Could you give your uh, audience just a minute to go over this paragraph on their own and then maybe... Sure, sure, sure. Definitely. Definitely. You could please take a minute and go over this. We have some responses coming yes. in. So yes. Niketa says, who was doing what? Very good. Who said what? And how different stakeholders reacted? Fantastic. 
demography has already been put down yeah. deepthi says the field as it was felt or seen by the ethnographer i mean felt seen excellent or... excellent field as was felt seen, seen or heard seen or heard by god no anything else what is the scene that is unfolding yes i'm just asking that i'm just asking that of the participants don't put it down okay 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 all right i think anand has also received responses the scene unfolding is that of an evacuation okay tragedy that is coming tragedy that is coming excellent yes yes and i was actually coming to that with this question which is what would be one word to describe what is happening here so i will probably uh, are any of you don't mind note down these here itself yeah yeah no i don't mind i just yeah. uh, anusha is saying a sensorial approach to the scene unfolding okay that goes up yeah yeah sensorial approach to the scene unfolding i would ask you all to also you know take a minute to just once you've read this uh close your eyes and think think of yourself as a researcher in the field at the time when all of these things are happening and Nik what Nik is yeah niketa has a response legally sanctioned development development is in courts okay so niketa if it wasn't in courts what word would you replace development with what exactly is happening here what is the first step for the development what are they doing first demolition exactly legally sanctioned demolition this time the court goes mm. yes and develop right. so yes. legally sanctioned demolition is for development is for that development. Yes, yes that's yes. correct yes absolutely right so think of it uh, think of it folks that you are a researcher in the field when all of this is happening what would be like you know your reaction as a researcher would you be sitting down and taking field notes in one corner observing whatever is happening uh, i would probably think no uh, so in that situation if you have to think of one word to describe whatever is happening whatever situation is unfolding all this evacuation tragedy how how would you describe it what what adjective would you use to describe it one adjective one word to describe the event here rockers, rockers. fantastic you raj is insensitive yes insensitive injustice all of that yes turbulent 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 absolutely and namrata has a thought maybe you'd like yeah that. yeah the researcher was aware of the pre announced demolition time and was present or happened to be living in the basti and could therefore rush to the spot uh we are not sure about that we know that this is what the researcher has seen whether or not the researcher was aware of the pre announced we don't know because it the way it is written if you look at it that on a night so and so like the municipal corporation of offices descended on this shift camp uh, it may or may not have been pre announced so the, uh, the there is a sense of suddenness in all of this don't you agree and if this was pre announced then the residents might also be aware that yeah they might be prepared for it right exactly 
it does not seem like they are very prepared exactly there's another response to your question though uh, yes which yes is, neha says ruckus turbulent and spectacle spectacle okay fantastic thank you so much thank you so much neha okay so we can agree that this is all a chaos right this is all a there's there's so much of ruckus it's absolutely a turbulent situation uh so the question that i would like to ask is uh how do we narrate a chaotic event in a way that we the, the chaos comes through our writing it's not like you know uh changing the chaos into a seamless uh piece of writing but actually showing the chaos through our writing and for that i think what we could do is take a little closer look more attentively pay attention to the words in this uh text so um, let me first ask you that you can see some of these sentences are marked in yellow some in green some in pink blue so let me first ask you uh, what do you think of the sentences marked in yellow what are these sentences what is the moment that these sentences are capturing if you could put that down on the chat so, i think they are describing the scenario they are describing the, the scenario was... very good they are describing the setting right uh something that yes. is happening the women were fetching water from the community taps children were playing in the streets fighting the cold the day laboring men had not yet returned from their construction sites uh, some was someone was telling that it could have been a pre announced thing see this is also an indication that it is not pre announced because if it was pre announced the day laboring men would probably have been back and ready for such a thing to happen uh, clearly you know it looks like a normal day in the uh, a normal morning of uh, dawn of 2007 january 3rd just like any other day so um, these are things that mark the setting now let us pay attention to the parts marked in green and also in these parts marked in yellow which give us the setting please note how the tense is used it is were fetching so it's past continuous right now let's see how uh, the in the green sentences the tense changes all right so um, it says a team of 50 policemen four bulldozers and a dozen municipal corporation officers descended upon shift camp another instance i'm reading out the group of officers stepped forward asking for the pradhan while the demolition squad went for chai shift camp residents were told that in 30 minutes the bulldozers and sledge hammers would begin their work and then finally the chief officer recommended that people remove the belongings from their home before turning to retrieve his cup of chai what do you think is like you know these sentences are doing may i yeah the first word which comes to my mind after reading this is the intervention so intervention so very interesting that, uh, hmm go ahead so yellow part was the yellow part was the scene and hmm? sorry green part yellow part was the scene and this green part is making the intervention Excellent. And the blue part is the reaction to those things. Um, excellent, like that. excellent, fantastic, absolutely fantastic. This is an intervention, an interruption to an usual day, and the blue parts, as you rightly identified, and I will read them out to you. Nevertheless, uh, a child yelled, "Sarkar aage, government has come." People panicked. People scattered. Some shouted. others followed the officers begging for answers 
So what you see here, these are reactions. So you have a normal day, a setting that has been given. In that, there is a certain event that is occurring, right? The event is a moment of interruption. It's a moment of intervention in that sense. And from there, you have the reaction of the people, the normal life, how that got disrupted by this event. So you see how these three things are lined up. You see that, you know, it begins by telling us how things were, how people were going about, when this is happening. And, uh, you know, the, the also I would request you here to pay attention to some of these words. While the demolition squad went for Chai, shift camp residents were told. So these are simultaneous things, simultaneous actions that are happening, right? The word while is indicating that to us. Another very important thing uh, beyond uh, this particular narrative unfolding of the event that I want you to pay attention to, and some of you have actually uh, already mentioned that in the previous slide, it's about this, you know, extreme uh, sensory description that we see here. Now, uh, following our method of close attentive reading, uh, sight, of course, we can see, like, you know, what are the words, what are the sentences, what Gertner is uh, likely to be seeing, we can see that. Uh, how about sound? What are the parts in this paragraph that indicates what kind of sound Gertner might be hearing? Not only then, maybe sounds that he has captured in his recorder, for all you know. Yelled, bulldozers, very good, Anusha, excellent. Excellent. So, Anything else? Yeah. Um, what's happening in the sentence in pink is probably yeah. the chatter that has been. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shantun. Yes, uh, Yuvraj footsteps and Shantun. Uh, right. Those sentence in pink, which is a series of questions, and I'll come to that shortly. Uh, those might also be questions that were being thrown around, uh, all around Gertner, repeated, maybe not in that organized fashion, but definitely there, very much there amidst the people. Now, let's pay attention to smell. Do we see any uh, words or senses, anything that you can smell while reading this? Stove burner. Okay, very good, Wasif. Excellent. Anything else? The chai. The chai, the smell of the chai, right? Very good. How about, you know, the uh, smell of dust? Yes, absolutely. And uh, as we move on to look at the taste, the, the sense of taste. Can you feel some kind of a taste? A taste of something, do you feel? Chai. <laughs> chai, yeah. <laughs> the chai comes back over and over again, right? The taste of the chai. And how about feeling, like tangible feeling? Cold. Thank you, Namita. Yeah, and Deepti is saying, do you really feel the sense of smell and taste? Just asking generally. Uh, Deepti, I'm asking you as a reader, do you feel it? Okay, okay. All right. But uh, I mean, when I was reading the description, I could almost, you know, smell that chai coming out, you know, as they were in the early morning dawn cold winter Delhi morning. So maybe, I don't know. But uh, what the point I'm trying to make here is that when a researcher is coming back from the field note and writing up uh, their work, it's not just a record of what they see. It's a record of a complete sensorial experience. It's a record of everything that they have seen, they have heard, they have smelled, tasted, felt, 
and all of these things like you know all of that uh, all the senses that are there uh, how one can bring that into one's writing i think this is a brilliant brilliant example of that and uh, some of you <coughs> also have mentioned that there is a, a sense of panic there's a sense of helplessness yes of course those are there uh, but is there any word here in this particular uh, passage that makes you feel that panic or helplessness what Any about people panic lot of people panic and also look at the sentence construction people panicked colon you know the immediacy the the the, the urgency of that very short sharp part of the sentence uh, so in that sense yes all of these things come into our writing all of these things become an integral part of how we describe an event uh, when we are writing up uh, our field notes now i would like to take you through a series of questions and uh, these questions need not have a very specific answer but uh, i would also request you if you could unmute yourself and answer them just think about them let us think together with these questions uh not necessarily writing it out uh so we have seen that there's one reaction given which is a child yelled sarkar aage government has come which is the translation of sarkar aage why do you think that uh, gertner has picked up this particular reaction i mean that there, there must be a lot of reactions happening to the fact that 50 policemen and bulldozers and officers have descended upon the shift camp why does uh, gertner choose to write about this particular uh, reaction why do you think anusha is saying it encapsulates the fear that they were living in Okay, okay. Pritha, the, if, sorry, if no. I may, um, I'm just wondering, what is interesting to me is that the child says Sarkar Agai, not Police Agai. Exactly, agai. exactly, exactly. So, uh, do you think that could be one of the reasons that Gertner chooses this particular quote, where the child is saying Sarkar Agai, and look at what uh, is the line that follows and like added by and it says the group of officers so what does government mean what does sarkar mean to people living in the urban slums it does not mean some abstract entity of the state but the group of officers but the group of police officers right so this this this, this juxtaposition it, it just brings out so much it says so much about uh, what uh, uh, you know the meaning of government is to these people what is their relationship to the state just by picking up that quote there is so much the so much of argument that gertner is actually making which lies implicit in the choice of this very quote now uh, moving on to the next question so you see that you know there are so many questions uh, which huts would fall which would remain what was going to happen to those displaced why was this happening and as uh, uh, shantan has pointed out to us uh, these are actually questions which are scattered questions these are representative reactions of all the people out there right and uh, another thing that i would want you to pay attention to is uh, the sentence the chief officer recommended that people remove the belongings from their home before turning to retrieve his cup of chai these two actions that are happening one that the chief officer is recommending that people remove the belongings from their home and two he is right after that turning to retrieve his cup of chai what does this sentence imply if i ask you if i can just have you think about it and respond to that what does it tell us about the officer authority like he he enjoys that authority that uh, 
doesn't care about what will happen. Didn't care. Yeah, the reaction, the you know, the response of the authority to all of this that is happening. We are looking at uh, what the uh, what the authority is doing only as action, but it is also about their reaction to the shift camp residents, their reaction to this world that they are demolishing, the complete nonchalance, uh, how that gets uh, you know represented here and. This tells us so much about power. This tells us so much about, uh, you know, what the state is, the rea the relationship of the people with the state and state's relationship with these people uh, in response to that. So uh, as you see here, you know, all of these things, there is no argumentative, there's no sentence here that directly gives us an argument. Can we agree with that? Yes, no? Is there a sentence here which has a direct state with stating an argument directly? Yes, no, if you could respond on the chat box. A sentence which is... Satish says agree. Agree it's that Satish. there is none? Is that what you're saying, Satish? Yes. Yep. So there is none, but there is an argument. There is a so actually there is a series of arguments, a less and less of arguments, all of which are hidden within the description, all of which are uh, sort of implicit within the description uh, that we are reading. And this is probably uh, one of the great ways in which one can uh, narrate a chaotic event one can uh, you know write up what one is observing as an event on the field how they can bring it in writing in such a way how they can describe it in such a way that uh, the mere description of it can actually elicit uh, the argument and also probably uh, you know reflect the politics of the writer Right. And one of us, uh, I think, um, uh, in our earlier sessions, we're talking about the politics of the writer pertaining to the bibliography and the list of references, if I'm not wrong, one of you said. So this is also an instance where the politics of the writer gets reflected. So another thing that I would want you to pay attention to is that this act of choosing that, you know, the, to choose the fact that this reaction of uh, the child Sarkar Agei had to be put in quotes while there are others which are paraphrased or representative reactions are being given. Uh, this is something one can think of like the act of choosing a quote from a text. When we are reading a secondary text, when we are reading a book, when we choose a quote from that book, we are usually picking that up thinking, which is which part of this source can be turned into evidence or rather which part of this source will allow me to make an argument so that it becomes an evidence in my work right so when you look at your field notes my suggestion would be to think of it in the same way rather than thinking of it as a completely different thing think of it as a text which is the part that is going to further your argument and just pick up that part and set it up accordingly and I think that could be a uh, like way of also not think of uh, everything as oh the social science is different from humanities is different from science from literature etc. Uh, to think of what is it that is the similarity in our process. Some of the things that we probably do also like you know quite unconsciously to make ourselves conscious about that process. So this was about the events. Now how about interviews? We have uh, discussed that, you know, interviews is a genre of writing and academic essay is also another genre of writing. But how do we set up and narrate an interview? How do we, uh, you know, bring it into our writing? The question is whether or not it follows the same logic of using a quote from a text. So that brings us to our second excerpt.
and this is where i would uh, request uh, someone to volunteer once again this is a section from chapter 5 again this is where uh, gertner is actually having a, a chat with uh, these men in the basti shift camp this is not at the moment of the demolition this is on another day that he's sit standing and he's talking to these people and uh, they are discussing about different things so if i could have a uh, like you know somebody to volunteer to read this it would be wonderful it's also there on your handout excerpt 2 if you want you can also refer to the excerpt there i will make this full screen to make it easier to read anybody Should I read it, Pritha? Yes, Ananya, that will be wonderful. It was extremely common for men in shift camp to tell elaborate stories of their one-time opportunities to become rich and successful. Except they would say, "Such was not their fate." One day, while I was answering a group of boys' questions about obtaining employment outside of India, Lakshman. began describing his experience working in mauritius as a clerk for the indian foreign service open quote i lived there for 6 years <clears throat> i had a great boss work was easy i earned 5000 rupees per week i fell in love with a muslim girl there who i had helped complete some forms she loved me very much and there was no difference between us but her family said i had to become muslim to marry her and i couldn't give up on my india so i didn't marry this beautiful woman she would send me lakhs of rupees even now if i asked close quote he used this story to suggest that the fleeting nature of certain experiences is a product of one's fate he was able to live in a foreign country find love and earn good money but those things were not in his fate open court i got in a fight with a cop of tin and had to leave that place close court he returned to <coughs> and i quote his india when his fate guided him here it was the intersection of a set of external events with his inner tendency that led him back to india <coughs> a differently fated person i someone with different values placed in the same situation might have arrived somewhere else even the right knowledge he went on to say could not ensure success and fortune a point he made through his description of another missed opportunity and i quote i was offered a visa to work in america the passport visa and even airplane ticket pair <coughs> i'm sorry <clears throat> something seems to be matter with uh, ananya should i continue reading no problem really so sorry yeah. <clears throat> yeah. i was offered a visa to work in america the passport visa and even airplane tickets were ready there were 6 days before my <laughs> departure so i went to pune to see a relative i had 100 rupees with me i bought food and took a taxi and was left with only 30 rupees I didn't have enough money to go to Mumbai so I asked a friend for money who laughed saying you're going all the way to America and can't even buy your train ticket to Mumbai I got angry and said forget it I don't want to go to America anyway and I returned and then Gertner says to Delhi question mark is uh, that's the uh, like you know what it implies it wasn't in my fate to go there otherwise mm. i too would be living in one of these kothis i would have had lakhs of rupees and a car there where our fate takes us we must follow <clears throat> looking back at the events that had befallen him lakshman signaled that his return to the basti after failed attempts to journey abroad the topic of the group's conversation into which lakshman entered were due to his inner tendency his own decisions and dispositions that had they differed 
may have led to a different fate. So before I go ahead, I would like to hear from you. What do you think of this uh, passage? Uh, if I ask you to uh, tell me in one word what comes to your mind when you read this, what would that be? Take a minute, read it again if necessary, and you can respond on the chat box. Destiny. Destiny. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Satish. I'll come to that shortly. So as you can see, there are some sentences in this that I have marked in yellow. <clears throat> and there are certain sentences that I have marked in green. I would also want you to think about the difference between these two sentences, these two kinds of sentences. While you are reading it in your mind, pay attention to that. So Anusha says use of first person and third person. Okay, interesting. Niketa says yellow is a narrative. Green is theorizing of that narrative. Okay, okay, Niketa. Ashima says yellow is direct speech. Very good. So Ashima, when you say direct speech, do you see any difference between how, uh, you know, the uh, these uh, sentences in yellow, anything just by the look of it? Anything different from the other sentences? Any punctuation marks that stands out? In, in quotation. quotation. Exactly. So the ones in yellow are quotes. So they are what Lakshman is saying. And the ones in green, as somebody pointed out, it is theorizing what Lakshman is saying, or rather, it's basically Gertner reading Lakshman. Gertner is showing us how Gertner is reading what Lakshman has been saying. What is Gertner's uh, reading of Lakshman's narrative in that sense? And if you pay attention to it, you will see that, uh, you know, all of these things, the way these quotes begin, they are not uh, just out of the blue, you don't have quotes. They are all quotes which are set up the same way that we set up our quotes when we are quoting from a text. In the interviews as well, you have a certain kind of a setup of the quote. For instance, this uh, block quote that is there, it begins with even the right knowledge, he went on to say, could not ensure success and fortune, a point he made through his description of another missed opportunity. So it's giving us a short summary. It's, it, it's setting up what is going to come. And then comes the interview. And following the, like, you know, the part of the interview that Gertner is quoting, and following that comes Gertner's analysis of that. Now, one of you, I, I think Satish pointed out, that uh, this was uh, something related to destiny. Uh, the word that comes to mind was destiny. Now, the thing is, this particular paragraph and many such paragraphs like this, many such transcripts like this, uh, where these people who Gertner is talking to, they, he noticed that they are using the word kismat. Kismat in Hindi means uh, something on those lines. You know, you could think of it as destiny. Uh, it's a Hindi Urdu word. Uh, what Gertner does is pays close attention to the repetitive use of this word. And he actually goes on to theorize Kismat as a theoretical concept. 
So this brings me back to something we have been telling across this, uh, you know, workshops, series of workshops, that it's not like your theory has to necessarily come from outside. It's not like they have to emerge from your Foucault and Bourdieu and so on and so forth. They might also be something that comes from your work. It could come from your field work. It could come from your interview transcript. And uh, I will come back to this once more. But before that, I would just like to take you shortly uh, to the paragraph that comes before this. Uh, and this also is important because of what we were talking about uh, working with other languages, right? So, it's very easy to say kismat is destiny or kismat is fate. But Gertner is paying attention to the use of the word kismat by these people and noticing that they are not really just talking about fate. They are also talking about luck. They are also talking about chance. Ki, you know, chance nahi mila. Kya kare? Kismat kharab thi. You know, that way. So, the, the fact that kismat is not a straightforward translation to a predetermined outcome, which we understand by the word destiny, but something more than that. So, Gertner notices this. And Gertner uses this word kismat as a theoretical concept. And uh, he develops on this by borrowing from another uh, the like, you know, person called uh, George Simmel and who has written on fate and uh, he borrows the definition of George Simmel's fate where George Simmel is telling that fate is also something uh, which is like you know it it's an inner tendency it is not just something which is like some kind of a destiny but it's also about an inner tendency and with that borrowing that uh, input from, Gert uh, from George Simmel's work what Gertner is doing is he's coming to his own theorization which is perhaps more important for understanding shift camp residents use of fate assessing occurrences or experiences as fate simmel's framework suggests means that individuals are encountering alternative frameworks of value that either contest or further their inner tendency I will read it once more. Perhaps more important for understanding shift camp residents use of fate or kismat, the word that they are using, or assessing the occurrences, what is happening in their lives and their experiences and so on and so forth, uh, to call them fate, uh, Gertner feels that it's in, uh, Simmel's framework is useful because then uh, what we see here is that the individuals are encountering alternative frameworks of value that either contest or further their inner tendency. Now, to come back to our uh, passage, and again, this is also there on your handout. What you will notice if we pay attention to what uh, Lakshman is saying here, Lakshman is saying that, you know, he wanted to go and he had, um, he, he could marry this Muslim girl and become very rich, but he could not give up on my India, his India, right? So he calls this fate, he calls this kismet, but it is not so much kismet as his value system, where he holds his nationalism, his patriotism, his devotion to his country more important than choosing a life where he could leave his country, marry a Muslim girl and become very rich. So this is an alternative value system determined by his inner tendency. What is it that uh, he would, uh, what comes from his own self, right? Similarly, if you see the later thing also, the fact that he's asking his friend for money and his friend jokes around that, oh, you are going to America, you have money, you don't have money to go to Mumbai. He's saying that it wasn't in my fate. But what has actually happened is that he took it upon his ego and he got his ego got hurt. And he's like, oh, I got angry and said, forget it. I don't want to go to America anyway. It's not fate, right? It's a certain action that he's taking because of his inner tendency. But he is terming this as kismet. 
So these are instances from which Gertner is coming to the conclusion that the way the word kismet is being used in the, uh, you know, uh, interviews of or the talks of the people in shift camp, it's not so much a predetermined outcome as it is a certain kind of a uh, expression of an inner tendency, a certain kind of a expression of a value system uh, that they have. And that becomes the basis for an entire section of his chapter, which he goes on to create a concept called Kismat. So that is, I would say, the, you know, power of, a, a, you know, good close reading of uh, the interviews, which can lead, which can have immense potential to actually lead to certain kind of theorization. And today, of course, we know that the method is called grounded theory method. And this is why it is called grounded theory method, because it's coming from the ground. The theory is not coming from up there, but it's emerging from the, uh, you know, whatever field notes, whatever inputs are coming from the ground. So this is one instance where... May, I, may I add something, Pritha? Yes, Let's Ananya, say. please. So I really enjoyed how you unpacked this for us and this idea that you can take <clears throat> a word like kismat and it's, it's in the Urdu, it's not in English, and it's translation built in these layers of theorization. I really love what you did here. But the question is why? Why would we bother with this? Why would Gertner bother with giving us a very layered, theoretical, nuanced understanding of Kismat when very easily it could just be translated as fate? In fact, it is. Uh, every time I assume uh, Lakshman said Kismat, that word appears as fate. And if we count, I think at least five, six times the word fate appears here. Hmm. So the Part of the reason why Gertner is paying so much attention is because fate then also turns to fatalism, right? Yeah, yeah. And fatalism ki nahi hua kyunki kismat hai, right? Exactly. That, that fatalism is one way to dismiss what someone like Lakshman is actually saying, right? Yeah, yeah. So the fact that all these missed opportunities uh, could and you know he begins by saying that it was extremely common for these uh, men in ship camp to tell him elaborate stories it's very interesting that he doesn't want to dismiss what they're saying because dismissing what they're saying would be a very easy reaction thank you for pointing Not that out that. Huh. What Sorry. that allows Gertner to do, I suppose, we will see later. Exactly, exactly. And in fact, uh, in another place, he is, uh, this also reflects Gertner's politics. Because in another place, he's saying that it is a problem that the NGOs, the social workers that he's meeting, they are dismissing it. They are dismissive of these quote unquote elaborate stories of these people by saying that ha, huh, this is so, you know, their fatalism kind of a thing. But Gertner chooses to sympathize with them, to empathize with them, and then look at it closely to understand what is actually happening. That, you know, th these are not things to be dismissed. These are things which hold a lot of value. And that leads him to come up with the theory of Kismet. Uh, does that answer what you are saying, Ananya? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, this is what we achieve. This is the potential of paying attention to what is being said uh, in an interview. And uh, now what I would uh, want you to do is uh, to take a look at what happens when we start paying attention to how something is being said in an interview. So what is being said we have seen and before i go on to this part i would want to know from you if you have any questions any doubts regarding what we just discussed i know it was heavy so if you would like to take a minute to actually process this and ask any questions i would love to take it up any observations you could also unmute and talk in terms of what do you think about it Anybody?
is there anyone here who is doing field work uh, right now or like you know struggling to or maybe just in the process of translating their field work into writing if i could hear from you also sitting with your interview transcripts trying to put it into writing uh, what do you think about this yes wasif uh, yeah like uh, uh, that that is something which i am also trying to do at this moment and uh, one thing which uh, i was thinking about is Uh, the overall tenor uh, of gertner's uh, understanding of what's going down on the ground mm. and as we were discussing that he's building theory from the ground you know mm. of kismet for example he's using it mm. uh, but later on in the chapter that i was reading chapter 5 that was mm. you know, that was to be discussed mm. also uses a, a very over encompassing frame of power yes absolutely he is using uh, you know these ground up theories to sort of uh, say that you know there is nothing outside of power as well exactly there is like there are two things happening one is he is building up theory from the grounds up mm. and then there is a frame a theoretical frame overall frame where the narrative is fitting in yes so, so my question would be then is there a di- di- you know dialectic between the two a dialogic between the two processes where we are using the source and building upon a theory absolutely so the thing is that the idea is say you're talking about power and uh, one of those first rookie things that we'd all do as academics is okay i have to write about power first i like have to go to foco and then quote foco and then start and see what evidence i can fit into this entire thing and uh, at the earliest stages of our research i think many of us are guilty of uh, doing this at some point or the other uh, whereas uh, what this is doing is to think about power you don't first have to go to foucault you first can think about power by looking at what is happening here what is happening in your material get the understanding of how power is manifesting itself and then connecting it to the critical theoretical frameworks that you are have available because of course we do not work again academic work is not happening in isolation right they are constantly in conversation uh, with each other so I- I- even here you know when he is theorizing kismet he is going to simmel it's not like he's not going to simmel simmel is a theorist who was uh, writing in german which has gotten translated and all of that which is probably the reason the word uh, you know inner tendency we were discussing the other day amongst ourselves you know how that is an awkward kind of a phrasing um, and that probably comes because of that uh, but uh, he's also going gertner is also going to simmel but the idea is trying to understand the ground trying to understand the material trying to understand the uh, evidence at hand to see how i can uh, weave out an argument out of it and then once the argument is coming out to go back to sameer's class how to complicate that how to make it more and more nuanced for that i bring in things from other sources it could be from another field experience it could be from another interview it could be from another text i have read or another critical theory reader Does that answer your question, Vasif? I have, I have something to add to that. Ritha. Yes. Yes. Vasif, the other thing to notice is how in the first extract that Ritha uh, used, where there's narrative of an event, there is not a single line of theory there, right? It just narrates the event. But as we were discussing, you know, the kid yelling, "Sarkar aa gayi," when the cops have come. is a moment where we understand exactly the power dynamics what is sarkar seen as right the the force of the police the fact that they don't have any notice about what is going to be demolished where the chaos and the confusion they want to know what to do but nobody at that point is like how dare you we have a right to be here right nobody is saying that at that point right so the 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 this is i mean of course this is about power there is no question of question about that but how do you work it out now as pritha pointed out is the only way to and this is quite often you know uh, early early career researchers quite often feel that if i quoted my fuko then i have made clear uh, what power is but letting that and of course you may have read your fuko and you know exactly how that is going to work and you see that in the field and you put it in your narrative 
right? Uh, you have begun to do that work and you're writing it up in a way where that comes implicit. And later on, you can have paragraphs that are analytic that, you know, we saw in Aparna Vedic's chapter as well, that, you know, the, the actual term habitus actually only comes in the conclusion, whereas in the entire chapter, she has worked it as a method, but she spells it out only in the end. And it's so much easier to read, right? So is it in dialogic conversation? Yes, but we're also paying attention to how it is written. And this method of writing makes it easier for writers to write and readers to understand exactly the point that you want to make. So I'll, I'll stop there. Does that help us in between what Preeti and I said? Thank you for both responses. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Persif. Uh, so I will now move on to the uh, to what I was saying that uh, now so now that we have paid attention to we've seen how paying attention to what is being said in the interviews what that can lead to now let's see uh, you know if we pay attention to how something is being said uh, what does that allow us to do and I would again request uh, someone a volunteer to please uh, read this out. This is also there in your handout. This would be excerpt three. Videos, I'll do it. Yes, Shantan, you can go. Okay, should I start? Yes. To be sure, residents did not want to be displaced, but most understood and many even empathized with the project they clearly saw as requiring their removal. One woman named Kishani, for example, stated, I have lived here for 30 years. This is my home. It is wrong to remove us from here, expressing a clear opposition to slum demolition. However, when I asked her what she thought Delhi would look like in 10 years, she calmly and without sarcasm said, Delhi will be a beautiful city, totally neat and clean. All the slums will be removed and there will only be rich people. Shiv camp residents often expressed such a desire for Delhi to become neat and clean despite their knowledge that this would require removing dirty and polluting spaces like bastis. When I would push residents to clarify how they could want a world-class city, even if it required their displacement, I noticed that we often reached a point where my interlo interlocutor would, almost in exasperation, talk about slums in a different voice. If she earlier described her experience in slums in the first-person voice, as when Kishani told me, after we built our huts, we thought the land was our own. Or in second person voice, as when she said, when you're given a ration card, you become a permanent resident of Delhi. She would shift and start talking about slums in general. Thus, while Kishani had earlier been describing her personal hardships in shift camp, when I asked why slums are being demolished, she said, slums are dirty. They aren't permanent. Slum dwellers don't live on their own land. Where is the subject located in this third person description? From where does this omniscient, distant voice depicting dirty slums come? Thank you so much, Shaita. So, uh, if you see here, this is uh, an interview of Kishani, another resident of uh, Shiv Camp, whom Gertner has interviewed. And what he is doing here is that he is paying attention to the construction of the sentences when Kishani is saying something. What he's pointing out uh, is that there are situations when he when Kishani is talking about, you know, how the slums are being removed and all of these things. Uh, she's asserting her identity as a slum dweller. She's saying after we built our huts, we thought that the land was our own. The first person voice or she was using a second person voice giving as if like a you know general kind of a uh, 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 like you know when you are given a ration card you become a permanent resident of delhi so she's giving us a procedure but also as a slum dweller she's still inhabiting the subject space of a slum dweller but then suddenly when uh, Gertner is asking, like, you know, um, uh, Kishani about uh, the world-class nature of Delhi as a city, her 
voice changes voice as in you know she's no longer talking in the first person or the second person and start speaking in third person start saying slums are dirty they aren't permanent slum dwellers don't live on their own land and Kutler is puzzled why is this happening i mean how is this person at once saying that slums are dirty and as a third person in a third person voice as if she does not inhabit the slum as if she is inhabiting a different subject space at once with a uh, statement like you know uh, uh we this land was our own we thought that this land is going to be our own or this is wrong to remove us from our land he finds it very quizzical and that leads him to ask this question that you know why is it that this voice is changing where is it that when when she's talking about slums as dirty dirty slums uh, and he points out and pay attention to these words calmly and without sarcasm delhi will be so i will just read out this sentence however when i asked her what she thought delhi would look like in 10 years she calmly and without sarcasm said delhi will be a beautiful city totally neat and clean all the slums will be removed and there will only be rich people it's very important here that gertner uses the word without sarcasm because in continuation to what kishani's narrative is where she's expressing her clear opposition to slum demolition if someone suddenly says that delhi will be beautiful city totally neat and clean it could be a completely sarcastic comment also right but it's not that's what surprises him and that's why he mentions it you know for his readers he makes them aware that it's not like she's saying this sarcastically she's very certain about it she's calmly saying this where is this coming from how is she inhabiting this third person subject space he of course goes on from here to theorize uh, further that uh, okay see you know the, the, all of this is happening is probably because of a certain kind of a hegemony and uh, uh, he goes on to i'm not getting into all the theorization but this opens up paying attention to the construction of the sentences paying attention to uh, how something is being said by the uh, inter interlocutor uh, can open up so many questions for the researcher research questions that where is this coming from and that becomes a prompt for furthering the research for taking the research further to find argue find answers to those questions so this is what happens uh, when we actually go ahead and pay attention to not only what is being said, but also how something is being said. And the way to bring in the, uh, you know, uh, to pay attention to how something is being said can often lead us to some very difficult question, which would probably lead us to more and more nuanced arguments. Another thing that I would uh, want you to pay attention to is this last part between the two yellow sentences, where you see that there is a sequencing of Kishani's statements. You know, it begins with, if she earlier described her experience in slums in first person voice, as when Kishani told me, after we built our huts, we thought the land was our own or in second person voice as when she said when you are given a ration card you become a permanent resident of delhi she would shift and start talking about slums in general thus while kishani had earlier been describing her personal hardships in shift camp when i asked why slums are being demolished she said slums are dirty they aren't permanent slum dwellers don't live on their own land so look at the sequencing it's not like shivan uh, kishani is say, saying all of these things at once one after another she has said this in the course of a huge long interview but gertner is picking these things up picking these things up and seeing in response to what question what answer shivani is giving and how she is giving an answer kishani i don't know why i'm saying shivani kishani is giving and what answer she is giving and how she is uh, framing that answer so much so that you know she uh, he even captures this almost in exasperation like you know the, she 
she, the, the uh, interlocutor is getting exasperated with Gertner's question and repeated probing from different directions uh, till finally something like this is coming up. So what I uh, want to point out that what the way Sami showed us the other day, how we look at one text and then we bring in another text to complicate our argument, to uh, make our, uh, to bring in more nuance to our argument. The same applies to interview transcripts as well. We might have a huge, like pages and pages, those of us who have done uh, transcription of our field notes, we know how many pages of transcription are there. So there might be one sentence somewhere in the first page, one on page 40, one on page 90. But to actually bring them together, to pay attention to these details, to closely read the interview transcript like a text, and then bring these things together in order to understand a contradiction, understand a connection, in order to build a more nuanced, complicated argument. That would be uh, the function of paying attention to uh, how something is being said. Does this make sense, everyone? Any questions? Any observations, any questions? So yes, as Ananya points out, you know, it would be easy for Gertner to just, uh, you know, pick up one part of the quote and say how that kind of leads to a certain argument. But the fact that he's bringing in the contradiction, he addresses the contradiction rather than avoiding it before because it is a difficult contradiction and uses that to build his own research question, uses that to complicate the understanding of what is going on. I think that is something very, very significant here. Uh, Yes, Gertner is close reading the interview. Very much so. Without no, the close reading, that would not, uh, one would not notice these things. Yeah. So, and, paying, yeah. you know, the same kind of attention to interviews as you would to written texts that you are quoting, you know, from the archive or from wherever, whichever book or article that you're reading or theorist you're reading. To treat interviews in the same way is the lesson that we are getting from you know this really excellent piece of writing that Gertner uh, gives us an opportunity to read and analyze, right? So paying close attention to text is not something that only literature people use at all. In fact, several of those qualities, descriptive qualities, I have used that first event description in other workshops and ask people without giving them any details, where do you think this is from? Everybody says, oh, must be a piece of fiction, must be a piece of uh, screenplay where the scene is being set up, you know, things like that. I mean, and when I tell them this is, you know, an academic writing in a PhD dissertation, eventually in a book, that this is a part of that, they're taken aback, right? So these are qualities well worth inculcating no matter what our uh, field of discipline is. Thank you so much for that, Ananya. So what did we learn about writing up interviews? First thing, write the use of interviews the same way we saw with our field notes. They follow the same rule of how we read our text, how we use quotes from secondary sources. Uh, the same way we set them up, we close read them, we analyze them, we put stuff together to bring out complication, all of these things, they, they hold true for interviews as well, right? Second thing is that uh, the fact that when we are conducting interviews in multiple different languages, it is important to pay attention to the contextual meaning of the words and to translate and explain them accordingly. Of course, we saw in great detail the word kismat and how that is being uh, played out in the context of what these uh, residents of Shift Camp is saying. But also, in fact, I would like to take you back a little bit here. If you remember uh, in the uh, earlier paragraph where there was this definition of the pradhan, the definition of the Pradhan was give, could be just, you know, the headman. 
the definition of the pradhan could have the gutler could have left it that way but no he goes on to give the explanation saying a pradhan is a headman a term used primarily to designate an informal or elected leader in villages and rarely used in urban contexts except in bastis pradhan literally means prime or first prime minister in hindi is pradhan mantri so you see how uh, all of these uh, details of what is the exact meaning in that context that becomes very very important when we are uh, looking at interviews in other languages uh dr bibita yeah if you could type out your question that will be wonderful so this is uh, one of the things that we pay attention to when writing up interviews uh, also as i said not just paying attention to what is being said but also close reading how it is being said as ananya pointed out that you know to, it's very easy to say that oh paying attention to first person second person third person these are things literature people do we don't do active voice passive voice literature people do we don't do but paying attention to those things in your interviews can also sometimes give you so many uh, insights uh, paying attention to those allow you to make uh, so much of nuanced complicated arguments so that is another thing that uh, i would like to point out so now let us think of it this way that uh, uh, when you have you have got no who has gone ahead done his field work he has recorded his interviews and all of which uh, are part of what we call qualitative research methods right and these all of these he has used to come up with his arguments and complicate his arguments uh, so on and so forth but social scientists many of the social scientists they often turn to quantitative data in their research work so let us think for once can statistical data help gertner strengthen his argument and in this situation i would also want to go back to what wasif was saying about uh, you know borrowing from critical theory uh, and looking at the field together uh, what happens when we also bring in statistical data into this can they actually help us as researchers to strengthen the arguments that we are getting out of our fields getting out of our interviews and uh, our research our qualitative research methods so this i would uh, also want you to open your hand out to the last excerpt now you will see that there is a graph that i have given here and uh, i know our experiences with graph we have all been very critical of uh, the graphs we saw in the covid paper and we thought that they really did not make any sense uh, so just to give you a little context here to this graph also this is actually a graph which initially was a graph uh, by mckenzie released by the uh, you know private entity called mckenzie who did a market research survey and uh, through that they came up with the estimation of the percentage of uh, poor people in the country like what to see the you know class of different people across time in india from 1985 95 2005 and then there were predictions this was something released in 2007 so there were predictions for 2015 and 2025 now if you pay attention to uh, this particular graph what is interesting is also that uh, this graph has been the gra the original graph uh, released by mckenzie has been tampered with here when i say tampered with uh, gertner has actually brought in his own inputs into the existing graph by the mckenzie and if you see those red bars can you see those red bars here if you can see these red bars these are actually things that gertner has inserted himself so what are these gertner says that okay you have done this research and you have done this on the basis of you are saying how much 
what is the class of people what percentage of people can go into which class in this country depending on their annual household income and their expenditure and so on and so forth but how about something like malnutrition have you thought of this category have you thought that you know if people don't have food to eat will they actually go and spend that money on something else other than food what if we bring in the numbers of people who are malnutrition who are undernutrition into this graph and complicate this and this what you see in front of you right now is actually a composite graph that way it has the the findings that uh, gertner has reached uh, through direct observation method of let even if you don't know what it is it does not matter he has what he is what it is doing is basically it is telling us a new category that gertner is introducing which is called the absolute poor and according to gertner the absolute poor is someone who is under or malnourished with this category he has inserted those numbers into the mckenzie graph to see how then one can understand the situation of the urban poor like kishani like lakshman and all the people that he has been interviewing so this graph if you pay attention to these words here in the graph in the original mckenzie graph they had created these you know tags for the different classes it was deprived aspirers seekers strivers globals these are words that the mckenzie report had and uh, gertner realizes that you know why that might be so if you look at lakshman's statements i mean what is it other than to be a seeker if you look at kishani's uh, hope of you know having a slum free delhi and all of those things she is an aspirer so all of these things are there when they are talking in their language these things do get reflected but does that mean that they are not poor does that mean that they are not absolute poor or under and mal what uh, gertner is gertner stag for the under or malnourished so with this uh, he also goes on gertner goes on to give a title to this uh, saying that you know i have also written it out here on the side because the title is very small uh, for in very small font it says uh, figure 6 deconstructing growth estimate estimation of the percentage of absolute poor in india overlaid upon mckenzie's so there is mckenzie's graph overlaid with uh, gertner's findings mckenzie's mythic represent mythic presentation of a future without poverty so the way mckenzie's graph looks like the way the 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 kind of as a market research firm who would obviously want to try to prove that people are not poor anymore uh, so they uh, they have this kind of a uh, you know they they are trying to make such a claim and what gertner is saying that this is a mythic presentation it's a myth and he's challenging that in two ways first he is bringing in his own calculations his own numbers into the graph to uh, create a certain kind of a composite graph here and second what he is doing is he is writing this up he is explaining this in a paragraph so i would request uh, someone uh, to please uh, read out this paragraph if that is all right uh, one volunteer please samir are you there still Yes, I can read that. Samir, could you please read it out? Sure. Writing up data. While McKinsey's data, provided largely by the NCAER, are proprietary and based on marketing surveys soliciting verbal responses from those interviewed, the national sample survey is based on a consumption and expenditure patterns. No, mass based on a massive field level assessment. Oh, sorry, I yeah, skipped a line. is based on a massive field level assessment that directly observes hundreds of thousands of households actual consumption and expenditure patterns 
yet the measure of malnourishment or the observation of real purchasing power do not figure in the magical incantations of middle class growth found throughout state and public discourse for this is an image not divorced from reality but productive of its own reality another mckinsey chart labeled quote winds of change represents an even more dramatic effort to paint poverty as an anachronism focusing only on urban households mckinsey suggests that the poor are already as of 2005 a small minority of the urban population and that sometime around 2013 the largest income group in indian cities will be the middle class or the quote seekers when barely 6% of city dwellers will be quote deprived using the direct observation method i have included a top mckinsey's graphic the number of absolute poor in indian cities between 1985 and 2000 the trend here yet again reveals the means by which the urban poor are falsely identified as an already emergent middle income group in mckinsey's presentation whereas mckinsey claims that only 13% of the urban population of india is deprived as of 2005 the method of quote direct observation indicates that more than 40% live below the poverty line a number that has stead- steadily increased over the past 20 years corner 24 thank you so much sami so what we see here is that gertner is looking at a series of statistics the the, the graph i showed you was only one but a series of uh, statistics one from the national sample survey which is a government statistics there are two mckenzie statistics one is the one that we saw earlier that he has tampered with and there is another one uh, called winds of change he is looking at all of this and he is saying that uh, exactly the point that i was trying to make earlier that in all of this that the measure of malnourishment or the observation of real purchasing power do not figure uh, in this uh, you know uh, chanting of how the middle class is growing throughout the state and public discourse for this is and this is where his argument comes that this is not an image divorced from reality he's saying that this is not happening because you know somehow people are not in touch with the ground it is happening because it's productive of its own reality and this is gertner's argument that because this is a picture that is being purposefully being fed to us it is in the interest of the government and a market research firm to actually prove that the poor do not exist that everybody has very high purchasing power whereas what his argument was as i mentioned earlier that uh, if the people don't have food to eat yes they might have money but if with that money they can't buy food food is also becoming more and more expensive especially in an urban situation where people can't grow food for themselves for the urban poor because that's the uh, setting of these all of this uh, quantitative research how is it that uh, you know people are going to go and buy stuff you are just looking at their income but you are not looking at the expenditure of these people on the food that they are consuming so if you actually have to do it you first look at the data about nourishment and see who like you know what is the measure of malnourishment in these places and once you put it there then you will see that the picture changes and rather than disappearing uh, the poor actually keeps increasing and steadily increasing has been steadily increasing over the past 20 years so why is this quantitative data important for gertner it is important for gertner because this is something that is strengthening gertner's argument from the field gertner has already seen that you know gertner has met a lakshman gave how he is aspirational in his own way he has found someone like kishani who is a seeker of a slum free clean delhi and he is thinking that okay all of these aspects like you know one can call lakshman an aspirer in that sense uh especially as someone who is probably going to america but this person also doesn't or even riding a taxi when he has 100 rupees in his pocket but that does not mean that the person has money to travel from pune to mumbai 
which is probably another like you know 50 rupees 30 rupees ticket you can go there but still he doesn't have that money he has to borrow from a friend and when the friend is not giving he's leaving all that and going away so basically what i'm trying to say here is that all of this data all of this quantitative data that he's looking at he's not just paying attention to numbers he's even paying attention to the tags in his statistics and probably this is not how of the government statistics would look the government statistics may not have words like this but mckenzie's do as a market research firm they have created such categories and by looking at that category the government statistics of course divide it as middle class and uh, so on and even there he's saying that the middle class are shown to be the biggest group but but uh, if you actually pay attention to how much food people are getting to eat at the end of the day, you will realize that all of these things are not true. And it is important for Gertner to look at this because it is very easy to dismiss someone like a Lakshman or a Kishani as either the urban poor or as you know or valorized as a seeker or an aspirer but the fact that they live in the interstices of both of this they are at once the absolute poor and an aspirer to understand that one can see that how this uh, kind of a quantitative data can actually help Gertner strengthen his argument make his argument more and more nuanced so social scientists when they use uh, statistics it is either to strengthen the argument that is coming out of field research or their interviews their events or even like you know situations where by reading the uh, statistics by reading the data they realize the need for a certain kind of field research they realize the need for you know a certain uh, interview that needs to be taken a survey that needs to be conducted a field work that has to be done in order to fill up the gaps in that data so that is how uh, th this is actually a, I, I feel a very good example of how data can be written about and still made accessible uh, if you look at the language here also as well you know the way Gertner is using words like dramatic effort to paint poverty as an anachronism or if you look at the way he's talking about the mythic representation and so on and so forth so Th that is also something to learn that how to write up data in a way that becomes uh, not only uh, useful in strengthening the argument that we are making that we are getting out of our field work we are getting out of our interviews uh, but also uh, to uh, make data and quantitative research more accessible to people in general so on that note just to i know i'm already like exceeding time so just to quickly wrap up and uh, go back to all that we have covered today i know we have done uh, we have it has been a very heavy session especially for the last session uh, but some of the things just to reiterate uh, when we are describing an event we began by describing an event we look at the details of the senses the sensory details become very very important and how we describe an event often uh, leads us to our argument often leads us paying attention to those details of the event often leads us to our argument second is uh, when we are looking at our field notes choosing a storyline what to keep and what to throw to say that the child says uh, sarkar aage hai the child yells sarkar aage hai to keep that and to uh, sort of paraphrase all the other questions that are coming up from very important questions that are coming up across the adults about where to go where will where are they going to get relocated and so on and so forth that choice depends on how we are going to build our argument third something i've been telling from the very beginning and i'm going to reiterate again and again is that uh, setting up quoting close reading and analysis these are not just methods for literary scholars this is something whether it's data whether it is interview whether it is uh, um, the events that we are writing about in our field notes or recording in our um, um, like you know recordings of the field notes they are all paying close attention to them and uh, actually going through this process of setting them up 
then giving us the quotes, then giving us a close reading of it and eventually arriving at an analysis from there is a process that is true for every sort of material that we are using. And finally, one thing that I want you to note, and this is something very personal because the first time I read Gertner, to be very honest, I was in awe of Gertner, but at the same time, I also felt that will I ever be able to do what this guy has done? And I don't know if any of you are feeling that. Are you? Can I get a quick yes or no? Are you feeling a little like, you know, unsure of how Gertner has been doing the job? Will I, will I be able to do a job like that? Yes, it is very, very easy to feel that way. But let me assure you, Gertner has not gotten here by in one go. This is not his first draft. He has gotten here through this. All of this is a result of multiple revisions. For all you know, you know, when Gertner is writing the writing out the child yells, Sarkar Agehe, he might have written the other stuff as well. But when he saw that this is what is leading to his argument best, he might have edited those things out. So please understand that all of these things are a result of multiple revisions, multiple redrafting. But at the end of the day, whatever we do, our analysis, our work always comes from our material. Our arguments do not precede our uh, material. Our material is what leads to our argument. And the process through which it does it is and always will be at some level close reading, whether you call it close reading or attentive reading, whichever words you, you want to use, it doesn't matter. Despite of discipline, whether it's a lab notes or whether it is an interview or a data or a field note or a text that you are reading, all of which will require some amount of close reading to arrive at your analysis. On that note, I would like to now open the uh, session up for any questions, uh, observations, anything that you might like to share. Was this helpful? Those of you who are asking for uh, sessions on social science, uh, was this helpful? Uh, Anusha, would you like to unmute yourself and tell us what exactly you found helpful in this? I really like how you uh, took us through, um, you basically made method out of the mess. You showed us how we initially, all of us in our writing process have, uh, we, we start with the mess and how we can make um, meaning out of the mess and use it eventually in some way or the other. It will seep in our writing it does all of it will definitely may or may not feature there but we can definitely make meaning and that is something i'm going to take with me as i write my doc doctoral thesis on immensely helpful thank you thank you anushan that's exactly the title no? what it looks like what it means it may look like a mess but you can make meaning out of it that's the entire purpose of the session thank you so much for sharing that anusha uh, anyone else if you could just unmute yourself and speak i would be really i would want to hear from you it's also the end of all our workshops so if you could just uh, tell us your observations uh, some reflections, questions, doubts, anything. Uh, we would love to hear that. Vasif, you had some very specific questions about this starting out. And we must say we kept your questions in mind in the prep. Uh, tell us if some of those questions are answered. Uh, unmute yourself and speak if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for really uh, addressing those things. I guess it's, 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 it's that we uh, sort of expect as pedagogically we don't expect these things to be you know I, I didn't you know uh, encounter these when I was you know maybe doing my MA or you know my my, my coursework this was something which was not it, it, it was as if it was ex, it was not explicit implicit that you figure out all of these things on your own yeah. on your own somehow yeah. but when you break it down like that it's it's uh, it, it's such a great help and it, it encourages one to, you know, simply write more. It makes yeah, it. Yeah, the idea is, you know, otherwise, you know, figuring it out on your own can often seem very daunting. 
and we don't always start out knowing what our tools are to break that process down so what our hope is and this is the reason why we also call our center the center for writing and pedagogy right? in the sense that what we learned is that if we break down the process of reading and writing we learn much about what we need to do as teachers in class and i know that a large number of participants here are actually faculty or was if someone like you is going to be teaching very soon if you're not already taking for a course for example right okay. so that when we are teaching uh, say a text other than content which is what we usually focus on what else might we focus on that makes the possible that makes the process of reading and writing accessible to students such as yourself but others as well at every level undergrad or phd doesn't matter right yeah exactly exactly yeah. Yeah. this would have been so helpful i am remembering my undergrad days and my masters like if if i would have just had the course like this it would have been so helpful along the way yeah, and, yeah. well better late than never <laughs> i guess and looking forward to you know Many yeah. more such workshops with you guys. I'm, I'm definitely looking Fatima, forward. I think Fatima is saying something uh, important. She's saying it's good to know everyone is in the same boat, and why is that important? Is precisely is this sense of community that we are not suffering alone. Otherwise, with reading and writing, that's the main problem, right? That it feels like everybody else is smarter than me. I am slow. I am stupid. i can't uh, you know catch things as fast as everybody else i take more time i am not smart imposter uh, syndrome am i good enough to even do this uh, all these doubts beset us because we think we are alone but the minute we do this together and invite participation turns out none of us are untouched by this not one person in this zoom room has not felt some or other variation of these feelings uh and then you realize that no this is a part of the process everybody is going through and you know you may be strong with some skills and need to learn others it varies but to know that this is something that happens to pretty much everyone who sits down to read and write and do a big piece of work um is again part of something we are hoping people will be ready to talk about and share and not keep this as an isolating experience alone right reading and writing is already an isolating experience you have to do it alone but there are parts of it that we need to do in a community um uh, and this is what happens there's a sense of okay we are not alone and if we read together we'll actually learn something more that we might end up collaborating where collaboration didn't seem possible something that came up in shantan session as well yeah so thank you thank you for that namita i also see himani has said something very important that you know these skills are rarely discussed openly and uh, that left mystified and uh, i think that is one of the that was one of the aim of this workshop or everything we do is yeah. to demystify the act of uh, academic reading and writing chaintan may i request you to share that cafe de senses link where we uh, so himani and others just to say in fact the metaphor of the boat comes up there a lot uh, there a lot of you know two years ago uh, my collaborator madhura lohkare who runs the uh, writing center at jindal uh, she and i co-edited a collection of essays about right academic writing in india and people wrote about their experience students teachers Uh, and many of these uh, things that we are talking about, and also experiences of classrooms, are collected. There are about twenty-two essays. Please take a look. Uh, some of that might be helpful to you. Uh, you know, again, getting that sense of community. Who are the people who are thinking about all of this? So do take a look at that as well. And why did I say the boat comes up there? Is because, you know. we are a writing center what does that even mean what is a writing center indian universities typically don't have writing centers and the metaphor that we used was you know that of building a boat and sailing it at the same time so you're building it and that's what we are doing we are bringing to you pedagogy that we are developing that is something we are still working out so while in the us writing pedagogy and writing centers are very common we realize starting this in india and doing this in india is not the same thing so we are building a boat and we are sailing it so it's a half boat that is being sailed 
Um, and, you know, workshops like this are helping us understand. Uh, and there is still a lot more understanding and work we need to do. Your feedback will be very, very helpful with that. You know, one of the things we tried to do was we really tried to get people to participate. And we got some participation and some folks didn't participate. Uh, we would love to hear about that from your end, uh, where, uh, you know, you felt it was like, if it is all right, again, we don't want to put you in a spot, but we do hope, uh, Shamalima, we can have a conversation on this uh, and we'll write to you separately about that. But right now, if everyone wants, anyone wants to speak up about the participation component and especially if you felt like you couldn't and you want to add something you would like to hear it um, or any other aspect of it but this this is another thing we are curious about uh, you know what enables people to participate what makes it difficult for people to participate is it technology is it time is it something else um, we would uh, like to hear if anybody wants to uh, ask about that or tell us anything about that Hello, uh, Miss uh, Siamulima Saikia has got the line and she's joining soon. So, sure. kindly wait for a minute, madam. No, sure. problem. no problem. Okay. Do you have, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Saikia, we know you are also a part of the organizing uh, committee. Uh, we've, we've yes, yes. Uh, yes, madam. If uh, you have anything to share, we would like to hear about. Yes, definitely, madam. Uh, actually, it was uh, an informal meeting with uh, Siamolima Madam, me and Nilpal Sutia to organize as FDP because it is very uh, necessary for our academic enhancement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have observed that uh, CWD Kriya University has done some good works in this area. And uh, we have written to the center and we have got some good response from uh, you and your team. And actually, uh, I could not join all the sessions because uh, I was busy in submitting the AQR of the college, but mm -hmm. uh, in the, at the inauguration session and the last session I have joined and I have enjoyed uh, what you have shared. And I think that all the contents will definitely help to uh, add some skills in the existing knowledge of the participants. And I am uh, very ha uh, happy uh, to uh, join SAS program and uh, I would like to say that this is beginning not the ending in the coming days we are also going to collaborating some works in some different uh, directions so we are hoping that we will get some positive response uh, from your sides so uh, we are from a very uh, from a college uh, rural based scholars and sometimes the participants are facing some network issues. Yeah. However, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we are trying to improve our academic skills and that is why we are going to organize some FDPs in the coming days. And I am very positive that uh, the Korea University will definitely give some inputs to develop our uh, agenda in the coming uh, days. Madam. Thank you, madam. Uh, and Yamulima, Madam is coming. Uh, she is joining with us. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Madam. Thank you. Uh, Fakhruddin has his hand up. Uh, we would love to hear from you, Fakhruddin. Only concern is I don't think Fakhruddin has joined through audio as uh, far as I see on my side. So might not be able to speak, but... Please. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so any other? Uh, yeah. uh, I think we have a lot of participants from Chicago itself uh, who can voice their opinions. We have our neighboring colleges also. 
Yes, we were very excited to see that, that, you know, so many colleges from Assam participants in so many, uh, you know, when we, you know, this is the problem with North Indians like us, right? It's like, oh, Northeast Assam, Bohati, right? But the fact or Dibruga, in some of the bigger cities we know about, we don't even know about. Um, and that's entirely our problem, our fault. But, uh, you know, something like this, you know, to see a registration list with names of all these colleges and places was so, so, so nice. It was so, it was so humbling uh, to see that there is participation from so many different places in Assam. So I'd like to ask, uh, we have Daisy Rani Talukdar who was actively participating. Can she share her views on this on this workshop, participating in this workshop? We also have Dr. Anita Kaur from Sonari College. Good to see you, Daisy. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. We have come to the end of this uh, week-long online faculty development program come workshop on academic reading and writing. Uh, research is an indispensable and integral part of uh, any academic program. Uh, when one sets off initial phase of a research program, it tends to be slightly confusing as uh, things are not streamlined. After attending this week-long FTP, I have seen that how all the sessions beginning from day one have covered the steps of uh, a research work in a very systematic and practical way, uh, starting from how to build up research questions, close reading of a text, how to formulate arguments on the basis of evidences, development of ideas by connecting different texts and to write up field notes across disciplines. Uh, research itself is a scientific process, uh, things at beginner's level tends to be inhibiting. Uh, if we go this uh, systematic way, as it is taught in all the sessions, uh, the inhibitions will disappear. Uh, this workshop is a new learning experience to me. Uh, I'm sure all the participants are really benefited uh, by this workshop. I extend my sincere thanks to all the resource persons from uh, Korea University for the informative, engaging, and enlightening sessions. Uh, I congratulate the organizing committee from Gorgam College for successful completion of the program. I extend my special thanks to Shamolima Soikya, uh, program coordinator of this FDP, uh, for giving me the opportunity to give feedback. Uh, and I expect more such uh, workshops in future from the organizers. Thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anita Kaur. It was really nice uh, getting your feedback. Yes, of course, we will have more such workshops uh, in the future. So uh, next, uh, I think Daisy Rani Talukdar, Dr. Daisy Rani Talukdar wanted to say something. Uh, I think Dr. Daisy is saying that uh, it's difficult for her to talk as she's connecting from home, but she will be keeping in touch. She's left a message okay. on chat. I see. Uh, we, also, we also have Dr. Abdul Mubid Islam from a nearby college, um, Sohit Yoli Fukan College. Yes. Okay, hello everyone. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, to talk about uh, my experiences regarding a workshop, it has been an incredible journey so far. Uh, most, probably, uh, most probably I have been a very passive kind of a participant. Uh, but today I have wholeheartedly uh, tried to uh, do my best because there have been lots, many, lot many of uh, work to be done in our college. And uh, but how I have been listening very attentively to all the uh, the entire week, uh, the sessions conducted by Ananya and uh, uh, Samir and uh, Shantan. I think uh, the article on the egg and swarm, the gazelles, or uh, of Agasa Idali. It was almost a kind of a heterogeneous ideas that have been totally collaborated and uh, brought under our purview. 
and it has been a very rewarding experience for me. And uh, I would personally like to thank the organizers for uh, making this uh, a very uh, uh, fruitful kind of a session altogether. And I really enjoyed uh, the entire proceeding of the FDP. So thank you. I would personally also uh, like to thank Dr. Prithag, uh, who was today's research person for being so patient with uh, the questions as well and uh, for really highlighting uh, with every possible minute details and that uh, could enrich the experience of a researcher from a researcher's perspective. So thank you and uh, all the very best. I uh, hope to see a uh, lot more FDFs and to join you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. That was a wonderful feedback from Dr. Abdul Mubil Islam. So yes, uh, indeed, uh, today's session was so enlightening, especially I think it will be a, extremely beneficial for social science researchers, teachers alike, uh, because uh, we have learned about things that um, like uh, field notes can be like uh, emerge, the experience of field notes can emerge from the sensory ex um, perceptions, then uh, how to use statistical data, then uh, paying attention to how something is being said, then uh, how theorization can emerge from the ground, uh, for example, interviews, etc. So I think these are uh, things um, quite new, um, a different way to look at social science research, and it will be immensely beneficial. Be immensely beneficial for all the participants. So not only uh, today's lecture, but also uh, beginning from Dr. Ananya Dasgupta's uh, session to Sandan Dutta's session, deliberation on uh, so many aspects of research, writing, then Samir Thomas. So I think all of them have worked very hard as we can see from their deliberation and um, they have uh, been thoroughly engaged with their work so hats off to all of these resource persons, extremely hardworking and uh, very interesting sessions these were. And uh, um, I definitely uh, thank, uh, I think uh, we are very fortunate to have such a kind of workshop uh, for people here and also participants for, from all over the country. So we also thank uh, the participants for their like engagement during the sessions. It was wonderful. Uh, and now uh, moving on, uh, I request Dr. Mrinal Ghosh, assistant professor from the Department of Commerce, Gorgon College to deliver the <coughs> vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. So it's time to offer our photo thanks. So on behalf of the organization committee of the one week faculty development program on reading and writing organized by Gorga College in collaboration with Center for Writing and Pedagogy, Priya University, I extend most sincere gratitude to Dr. Anena Dasgupta, Madam, Director Center for Writing and Pedagogy for agreeing to collaborate with us and sharing with us her priceless knowledge and expertise. We also thank her for taking the lead in the directing the course of the entire program, selecting the resources, interacting with the resource person and participants in each and every session and sharing her valuable inputs. We extend our thanks also to Shayanta Dutta, program coordinator from Center for Writing and Pedagogy for coordinating the program with utmost dedication and commitment and also for sharing their valuable knowledge with us. We offer our heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Samir Thomas and Pritha Chakravarti, Madam, and all to and to all esteemed faculty members of Center for Writing and Pedagogy for gracing our event and enlightening us on skills and practices of reading and writing common to researchers across disciplines of humanities, social science, and sciences, which we believe has been deliberated upon with much dexterity, erudition, and hard work. We are really enriched by the knowledge and insights you shared with us during the week 
and we hope to listen to you again in the future. Next, I offer sincere thanks to Honorable Principal of our college, Dr. Sabna Sachi Mahantasa, for his gracious presence at the inaugural function and, and, and for sharing his inputs and valuable words and giving us encouragement and support. Our heartfelt gratitude also goes to IPSC coordinator of Borga College, Dr. Surajit Saikyasa, for extending valuable support to us in organizing the FTP. Our special thanks goes to Dr. Dimbesha Das, Assistant Professor in Botany, Dr. Pankaj Natsa, Librarian, Korga College Central Library, and Nirupal Sutia, Assistant Professor in Economics for their technical support and making the best possible efforts in coordinating this event. Our heartfelt gratitude also goes to Ms. Ankita Datta and Ms. Shahin Sainaj Begum, Assistant Coordinators of this program, and Dr. Rashmi Datta, Assistant Professor in Geology, Gorga College, for rendering their valuable support. Finally, I also take this opportunity to thank all the faculty members, research scholars, and students from all over the country who have participated in this FTP come workshop and made our program fruitful. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrinal, for the vote of thanks. So um, before we go, uh, before, wind, before we wind up, uh, I would like to request all the participants to switch on their video so that we can have a kind of photograph. <laughs> And do share the feedback forms once they're all filled out with us, Shamlima. Of course. Yes, thank you. And if we could uh, set up a debriefing meeting between Shantan, you, uh, me, and if uh, Dr. Surujit Saikya also wants to attend, that would be great. Sure. Yes. Yes, so there are more participants. Boxes, so uh, those black boxes did have people behind them. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they were shy to talk. Uh, we have Shayantan. We have Shayantan on our team. Shayantan is not shy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if anyone else would like to share, we okay, also have one. I saw it. Like, yeah, from um, Kargan College. Sir, will you like to speak something before we wind up? Dr. G2 Saikia. I saw him, uh, he was there, but uh, yes, Dr. G2 Saikia uh, from Gargan College. I think, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that was a very like fruitful workshop and uh, we hope to again meet uh, again with some more programs with uh, Korea University, collaborate with Korea University uh, for the sake of other holding other programs, maybe uh, something on literature solely or maybe on social science. So I think um, one idea I uh, have come up is that um, Having a limited number of participants will be helpful. Uh, maybe I think it's difficult to cater to a large number of participants. So that's my view. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about yes, it in our detail. Yeah. yeah. We'll figure it out. So, Dr. Ananya Daskripta, will you like to uh, say something? I think we've said so much. All we can say now is thank you for actually yeah. participating and being here, and we'll be grateful for the feedback. Uh, I think it's time for all CWP people to just stay quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I like uh, just uh, had some problem with my laptop, and so I had no, to no problem, no problem. At all. Leave in between. So if okay. you've done the, uh, is the photograph done? You said there yes, was the photograph has been all completed. Right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you all the participants. Thank you to the resource persons. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Thank you, Sanson. Thank, thank you, Pritha Chakrabarti. Thank you. Thank you thank so you, much. Anita, thank you, everyone. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.